you talk about how your life turns upside down. And we don't have to go into details, whatever you're comfortable with, but you got arrested for possession of cocaine in 93. That was, you're still racing then. Um, what happens, you know, I mean, that, you know, everybody makes mistakes that you're able to move beyond that, continue racing, and then you quit racing and you, your life turned upside down. What, I mean, well, the, the reality of, um, I, I, I didn't get, I got charged with possession from something that uh, they found that had some residue or whatever. Yeah. But anyway, I was actually charged with sale of, which I didn't do. And because ever since we moved to Tennessee and, and my dad built a runway and he got airplanes and people assume things that weren't true. Right. So that's, I wanted to just, if I could interrupt you, I had long, long, like, I, forgive my ignorance. This is an ignorant, this is an ignorant thing that I did, but um, I somehow, at some point in my life, in the late 90s, all the way till probably a couple years ago, I somehow saw similarities in you and, um, you just mentioned him, um, raced down in Florida, came on Gary the show. Blue. Gary Blue. So, obviously, I don't think, I never thought that you and Gary did the same thing. Gary's, you know, he was right, he, smuggling. Yeah, drug, he smuggled. Drug smuggler. Yeah, he <laughs> right. smuggled weed up, right. up. Yeah, no, no, I never even knew him. <laughs> right. But when I would hear your name, I would think that I, I would do the same thing. I would because I read somewhere you had this arrest. Then I then I would think you know you'd hear rumors or you'd hear stories about you smuggling drugs up and down the road in the tires of your race car, right? Crazy things. Having never met you, never been in your world, never been nowhere near your world. And you thought, sounds exciting. I thought, oh. <laughs> I, I thought well, it fits the wild man, the, ba- you know, crazy badass persona yeah. that you're like, you know, just, a, you know, lawless. Um, <laughs> you know, it fit the... I mean, a little bit. A well, little I, bit that way, but not in in that way sure, there. Not you know, in that way. I mean, I definitely have been lawless, but uh, I, and I think it, people wanted to think. I think they wanted to. I think they you wanted to. We're doing. You were doing way more than was reality. Absolutely, because it fit that narrative in their mind. Well, and the hair didn't help. No, and the airplane and the runway and yeah. airplanes and it's just it's just something that. Naturally, people are going to want to talk, and and really, if they can't beat you, they want to try to make you look bad. Okay, that yeah. that's really the truth. Mm-hmm. I, I was really surprised that. Uh, Do you remember, like, rock bottom? Was there a rock bottom? Was there? A- you know that that I have always been a strong enough individual that when this happened, I knew the truth. But what was so bizarre, and and I was just telling you girls out front there this. Um, like I'll never forget walking through the trade show and Chris Economaki is at a booth and I didn't really care who he was or didn't really, I mean, I knew who he was, but so I'm walking by with my first wife and, and he says, Scott, Scott, he said, I noticed you don't subscribe to my magazine or my paper, you know, speech board, whatever. Yeah. And, I, and I'm like, yeah, you're right. I said, I don't, subscribe to that people don't research what they write about because they said something you didn't i'd won forty thousand dollars that month racing they printed i i took in forty thousand dollars that month in cocaine sales what really yeah oh i mean there's so much here's the thing about it the the mag uh, just not just the racing papers but all the radio stations all the local television stations i had been successful enough and and I have to hear you talking about you on the radio and the television. You know what I did? I turned all of it off. I didn't read any of the papers anymore. I didn't listen to the radio. I didn't listen, didn't watch television. I stayed at home and I went fishing and just, and you'll all know the truth one day because you're all wrong. And, and I won the only case of entrapment ever in the state of Tennessee. Yeah. So it, but it was just again 
That's rock. That's when you're talking about your world turning upside down. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, no, it, it was definitely an eye opener, and and you learned. It's really funny because you you had, for, yeah, I had a lot of people you know, right? And there's people you know, they go, man, I know you're doing that, man. Hell, I the damn done record, you know, just yeah. <laughs> Like, no, that's not the way it was. And then you have one that just won't even ever speak to you again and just turn their turn. head every time they see you. And you thought they were friends. And so you learn a lot about people. And, uh, Damn. and it's, it's, a, it's something that I'm not saying everyone should experience, but you really learn a lot about people. So, all right, I got so many questions. First of all, one is um, – I am a I am a an example of when you were going through that time and you mentioned have a Tampa Dale. I mean, that's when I first heard about Scott Bloomquist and it was somebody from work who said, I mean, I was in high school and they're like, hey, let's go out to Cleveland Speedways, Cleveland, Tennessee. Right. Uh, Cleveland Speedway. And uh, Scott Bloomquist is going to be there. And we're going to go watch Scott Bloomquist in the Have a Tampa series. And I'm like, all right, all right. I'd never been to a race, Scott. I'd never been. And, and this was in 94. So this was fresh off. I mean, like, I, I think it was 94 or 95. Uh, and so you would have been fresh off this arrest. Am I right? Am I getting the timing right? It was right. I think it was right at 95. Uh, you know, I was racing with Barry Wright and Barry – I, God love him. You know, he had to endure a lot of that with me, but he, you know, we kept racing and, and he told me, he said, you know, of any driver I've ever raced with, he said, he was shocked that my personal life didn't affect my racing and I kept winning and I kept, but I knew that it just wasn't real. It wasn't me. I, I didn't even, I wasn't even the person that even was part of the transactions or any of that, but they wanted me so bad that they turned it all around and and that's why they lost you know that's why it didn't pan out for them but it still put me through major education about life sure. and I, about people i guess my point on that is is that I, whether or not it's a good thing bad thing or true or false it you were even more it of made a draw. Me larger you, than life 100% it that's did, my point and, and, and yep. that's what my lawyer at the time said he goes he says it, it may seem bad right now but he said he said, in so many years from now, he said, they, they'll they just remember the name. And they, they won't remember why they know the name, but yeah. they will never forget the name. I, <laughs> I can't think of an example anymore of where, you know, um, an arrest actually built up almost a brand that drew more people to a track. And I, I remember people that. People had to people come to in, just look at you. That's <laughs> I, And I was one of them that day in Cleveland. Uh, so... Did you serve jail time? Because now I am confused about this. No, I, actually, what what ended up happening is uh, is they they found straw at our pro- uh, on the property. Who knows who's I don't know what it was doing there, but I guess it, it had some residue. They said so. They charged me with paraphernalia and possession from a straw. Yeah, that and the judge was they call him Maximum Beckner. So <laughs> he gave me maximum, uh, but. All I had to do was check in at night and check out in the morning for uh, six weeks. So, oh, never so, ever put an orange suit on if that's what you mean. No, no. Well, <laughs> the, no. The reason I'm asking is because you continue to race. Yes, because I got out for work work release. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, how that, that really work? pissed the judge off. But the sheriff said, "This is my jail. You run your." courtroom i'll run my jail and he was a race fan and i got to get out and race okay and i never stopped racing and i kept winning and every every weekend i'd get out and i'd win both events and the judge just was pissed off beyond belief and tried to get the the sheriff to not let me out anymore and and he continued let me out so it was really it was just bizarre because the people that really knew uh i'd get i'd check in at nine o'clock and it was hilarious because all of a sudden, I'm in this annex and there's just beds, you know, not a jail, but all these beds. And then all of a sudden I'd hear, boom, quiz, come to the front. I'm like, first time, you know. Uh, so I walk in the front and there's three pizzas sitting there. <laughs> uh-uh. So I sit there and eat pizza and sit and BS with them. And then I go back and go to bed. I actually got the most rest of my life then. But I, I, got, out at, <laughs> I got out at 7 in the morning and had to be back in by 9 at night. Wow. 
It was just it, the whole thing, really. It was a good experience for me. It made me, I met some interesting people through oh, it. Sure. Uh, you stopped racing from, I guess, what, 95 to 2003? No, 90, I never stopped. Uh, you won a championship I in never stopped. I never stopped racing other than a few you months. You stopped to have a tantrum. At 96, in 96 uh, to 97 is when I took my break, when I went to the Grand Canyon and all. And but, so, I mean, it was only for a few months. If you like that conversation with Scott Bloomquist, you ought to listen to the entire podcast. The Dale Jr. Download is available on all major podcast platforms.